The development of tanks in World War I was a response to the stalemate that had developed on the Western Front. Although vehicles that incorporated the basic principles of the tank armor, firepower, and all-terrain mobility had been projected in the decade or so before the war, it was the alarmingly heavy casualties of the start of its trench warfare that stimulated development. Research took place in both Great Britain and France, with Germany only belatedly following the Allies' lead. In Great Britain, an initial vehicle, nicknamed Little Willie, was constructed at William Foster & Co. during August and September 1915. The prototype of a new design that became the Mark I tank was demonstrated to the British Army on February 2, 1916. Although initially termed landships by the Landship Committee, production vehicles were named tanks to preserve secrecy. The term was chosen when it became known that the factory workers at William Foster referred to the first prototype as the tank because of its resemblance to a steel water tank. The French fielded their first tanks in April 1917 and ultimately produced far more tanks than all other countries, combined. The Germans, on the other hand, began development only in response to the appearance of Allied tanks on the battlefield. Whilst the Allies manufactured several thousand tanks during the war, Germany deployed only 20 of its own. The first tanks were mechanically unreliable. There were problems that caused considerable attrition rates during combat deployment and transit. The heavily shelled terrain was impassable to conventional vehicles, and only highly mobile tanks such as the Mark IV and FTs performed reasonably well. The Mark I's rhomboid shape, caterpillar tracks, and 26-foot length meant that it could negotiate obstacles, especially wide trenches, that wheeled vehicles could not. Along with the tank, the first self-propelled gun, the British gun carrier MKI, and the first armoured personnel carrier, the British MKX, were constructed in World War I. Topic conceptual roots of the tank The conceptual roots of the tank go back to ancient times, with siege engines which were able to provide protection for troops moving up against stone walls or other fortifications. With the coming of the Industrial Revolution and the demonstrable power of steam, James Cowan presented a proposal for a steam-powered land ram in 1855, towards the end of the Crimean War. Looking like a helmet on footed Boydell wheels, early forerunners of the Pedrail wheel, it was essentially an armored steam tractor equipped with cannon and rotating scythes sprouting from the sides. Lord Palmerston is said to have dismissed it as barbaric. From 1904 to 1909, David Roberts, the engineer and managing director of Hornsby and Sons of Grantham, built a series of tractors using his patented chain track, which were put through their paces by the British Army, a small section of which wanted to evaluate artillery tractors. At one point in 1908, Major William E. Donahue of the Mechanical Transport Committee remarked to Roberts that he should design a new machine with armor, capable of carrying its own gun. But, disheartened by years of ultimately fruitless tinkering for the army, Roberts did not take up the idea. In later years he expressed regret at not having pursued it. An engineer in the Austro-Hungarian Army, Lieutenant Gunther Burston, inspired by Holt tractors, designed a tracked armored vehicle in 1911 carrying a light gun in a rotating turret, equipped also with hinged arms, two in front and two at the rear, carrying wheels on the ends to assist with obstacles and trenches. It was a very forward-looking design, if rather small. The Austrian government said it would be interested in evaluating it if Burston could secure commercial backing to produce a prototype. Lacking the requisite contacts, he let it drop. An approach to the German government was similarly fruitless. In 1912, a South Australian, Lancelot de Mole, submitted a proposal to the British War Office for a chain rail vehicle which could be easily steered and carry heavy loads over rough ground and trenches. De Mole made more proposals to the War Office in 1914 and 1916, with a culminating proposal in late 1917, accompanied by a huge 1 8 scale model, yet all fell on substantially deaf ears. 
De Mol's proposal already had the climbing face, so typical of the later World War I British tanks, but it is unknown whether there was some connection. Inquiries to the Government of Australia, after the war, yielded polite responses that Mr. de Mol's ideas had unfortunately been too advanced for the time to be properly recognised at their just value. The Commission on Awards to Inventors in 1919, which adjudicated all the competing claims to the development of the tank, recognized the brilliance of de Mol's design, even considering that it was superior to the machines actually developed, but due to its narrow remit, could only make a payment of £987 to de Mol to cover his expenses. De Mol noted in 1919 that he was urged by friends before the war to approach the Germans with his design, but declined to do so for patriotic reasons. Before World War I, motorized vehicles were still relatively uncommon, and their use on the battlefield was initially limited, especially of heavier vehicles. Armored cars soon became more commonplace with most belligerents, especially in more open terrain. On August 23, 1914, the French Colonel Jean-Baptiste Eugène Estien, later a major proponent of tanks, declared, Messieurs, la victoire partiendra dans cette guerre et celui de deux belligerents qui parviendra la première et placer un canon de 75 sur une voiture capable de se mouvoir en tout terrain. Gentlemen, the victory will belong, in this war, to the one of the two belligerents who will be the first to succeed in mounting a 75mm gun on a vehicle capable of moving in all types of terrain. Armored cars did indeed prove useful in open land such as in deserts, but were not very good at crossing obstacles e.g. trenches, barriers, or in more challenging terrain. The other issue was that it was very hard to add much protection or armament. The main limitation was the wheels, which gave a high ground pressure for the vehicle's weight. This could be solved by adding more wheels, but unless they also were driven, the effect was to reduce traction on the powered wheels. Driving extra wheels meant more drive train weight, in turn requiring a larger and heavier engine to maintain performance. Even worse, none of this extra weight was put into an improvement of armor or armament carried, and the vehicles were still incapable of crossing very rough terrain. The adoption of caterpillar tracks offered a new solution to the problem. The tracks spread the weight of the vehicles over a much greater area, which was all used for traction to move the vehicle. The limitation on armor and firepower was no longer ground pressure but the power and weight of the power plant. The remaining issue was how to utilize and configure a vehicle. Major Ernest Dunlop Swinton Ree, was the official British war correspondent serving in France in 1914. He recounts in his book Eyewitness how the idea of using caterpillar tracks to drive an armored fighting vehicle came to him on October 19, 1914, while he was driving through northern France. In July 1914 he had received a letter from a friend, Hugh Marriott, a mining engineer, drawing his attention to a Holt Caterpillar tractor that Marriott had seen in Belgium. Marriott thought it might be useful for transport over difficult ground, and Swinton had passed the information on to the appropriate departments. Now Swinton suggested the idea of an armored tracked vehicle to the military authorities, by sending a proposal to Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hankey. Hankey in turn tried to interest Lord Kitchener in the idea, when this failed he sent a memorandum in December to the Committee of Imperial Defense, of which he was himself the secretary, Winston Churchill the first Lord of the Admiralty was one of the members of the committee. Hankey proposed to build a gigantic steel roller, pushed by tracked tractors, to shield the advancing infantry. Churchill in turn wrote a note on January 5 to the Prime Minister H. H. Asquith, in which he warned that the Germans might any moment introduce a comparable system. A worried Asquith now ordered Kitchener to form a committee, headed by General Scott Mancrief, to study the feasibility of Swinton's idea. However, after trials with a Holt 75H, P. machine the committee concluded in February 1915 that the idea was impractical.
Topic the Landship Committee Winston Churchill however decided that if the Army wouldn't take up the idea, the Navy should proceed independently, even if it were to exceed the limits of his authority. He created the Landship Committee in February 1915, initially to investigate designs for a massive troop transporter. As a truer picture of frontline conditions was developed the aims of the investigation changed. A requirement was formulated for an armored vehicle capable of 4 miles per hour, 6 kilometers per hour, climbing a 5 feet, 1.5 meters high parapet, crossing an 8 feet, 2.4 meters wide gap, and armed with machine guns and a light artillery piece. A similar proposal was working its way through the Army GHQ in France, and in June the Landships Committee was made a joint service venture between the War Office and the Admiralty. The naval involvement in armored fighting vehicle AFV design had originally come about through the Royal Naval Air Service Armored Car Division, the only British unit fielding AFVs in 1914. Surprisingly, until the end of the war most experimentation on heavy land vehicles was conducted by Royal Naval Air Service Squadron 20. At first, protecting heavy gun tractors with armor appeared the most promising line of development. Alternative early big wheel designs on the lines of the Russian Tsar tank of 1915 were soon understood to be impractical. However, adapting the existing Holt Company Caterpillar designs, the only robust tracked tractors available in 1915, into a fighting machine, as France and Germany did, was decided against. While armor and weapon systems were easy to acquire, other existing Caterpillar and suspension units were too weak, existing engines were underpowered for the vehicles that the designers had in mind, and trench crossing ability was poor because of the shortness of the wheelbase. The Killen straight tractor with three tracks was used for the first experiments in June but was much too small to be developed further. The large Pedrail monotrack vehicle was proposed in a number of different configurations, but none were adopted. Trials to couple two American Bullock tractors failed. There also were considerable differences of opinion between the several committee members. Call R.E.B. Crompton, a veteran military engineer and electrical pioneer, drafted numerous designs with Lucian Legros for armored troop carrying vehicles and gun armed vehicles, to have used either Bullock tracks or variants of the Pedrail. At the same time, L.T. Robert McPhee, of the RNAS, and Albert Nesfield, an Ealing based engineer, devised a number of armored tracked vehicles, which incorporated an angled front climbing face to the tracks. The two men fell out bitterly as their plans came to naught. McPhee in particular pursued a vendetta against the other members of the Landships Committee after the war. To resolve the threatened dissipation of effort, it was ordered in late July that a contract was to be placed with William Foster & Co., Ltd., a company having done some pre-war design work on heavy tractors and known to Churchill from an earlier experiment with a trench-crossing supply vehicle, to produce a proof-of-concept vehicle with two tracks, based on a lengthened Bullock tractor chassis. Construction work began three weeks later. Fosters of Lincoln built the 14-ton Little Willie, which first ran on 8 September. Powered by a 105-horsepower Daimler engine, the 10-foot-high armored box was initially fitted with a low Bullock Caterpillar. A rotating top turret was planned with a 40mm gun but abandoned due to weight problems, leaving the final vehicle unarmed and little more than a test bed for the difficult track system. Difficulties with the commercial tracks supplied led to Triton designing a completely new track system different from, and vastly more robust than, any other system then in use. The next design by Lt. Walter Gordon Wilson RNAS, a pre-war motor engineer, added a larger track frame to the hull of Little Willie. In order to achieve the demanded gap clearance a rhomboidal shape was chosen, stretching the form to improve the track footprint and climbing capacity. To keep a low center of gravity the rotating turret design was dropped in favor of sponsons on the sides of the hull fitted with naval 6-pounder guns. A final specification was agreed on in late September for trials in early 1916, and the resulting 30-ton 
Big Willie, later called Mother, together with Little Willie, underwent trials at Hatfield Park on the 29th of January and the 2nd of February. Attendees at the second trial included Lord Kitchener, Lloyd George, Reginald McKenna and other political luminaries. On 12 February an initial order for 100 mother type vehicles was made, later expanded to 150. Crews never called tanks willies. At first they referred to them as landships and later informally buses. Although landship was a natural term coming from an admiralty committee, it was considered too descriptive and could give away British intentions. The committee, therefore, looked for an appropriate code term for the vehicles. Factory workers assembling the vehicles had been told they were producing mobile water tanks for desert warfare in Mesopotamia. Water container was therefore considered but rejected because the committee would inevitably be known as the W.C. Committee. W.C. meaning water closet was a common British term for a toilet. The term tank, as in water tank, was in December 1915 finally accepted as its official designation. From then on, the term tank was established among British and also German soldiers. While in German tank specifically refers to the World War I type as opposed to modern panzer, in English, Russian and other languages the name even for contemporary armoured vehicles is still based on the word tank. It is sometimes mistakenly stated that, after completion, the tanks were shipped to France in large wooden crates. For secrecy and in order to not arouse any curiosity, the crates and the tanks themselves were then each labeled with a destination in Russian, with care to Petrograd. In fact, the tanks were never shipped in crates, the inscription in Russian was applied on the hull for their transport from the factory to the first training center at Thetford. The first 50 had been delivered to France on 30 August. They were male or female, depending upon whether their armament comprised two six-pounder cannon and three Hotchkiss machine guns or four Vickers machine guns and one Hotchkiss. It had a crew of eight, four of whom were needed to handle the steering and drive gears. The tanks were capable of, at best, six kilometers per hour, four miles per hour, matching the speed of marching infantry with whom they were to be integrated to aid in the destruction of enemy machine guns. In practice, their speed on the broken ground could be as little as one mile per hour. After the war the Royal Commission on Awards to Inventors decided that the principal inventors of the tank were Sir William Tritton, Managing Director of Foster's, and Major Walter Gordon Wilson. Foster's returned to manufacturing traction engines and steam lorries, but incorporated a small trademark outline image of a tank on the front smokebox door of their post-war road locomotives. During World War II, Tritton and Wilson were called upon to design a heavy tank, which was known as TOG-1, named for the Old Gang, but this was not a success. However Lincoln City erected a full-size outline MK-1 as a memorial to the invention of the tank in 2015, and placed it on the Tritton Road roundabout. Dot. Topic. First deployments The first use of tanks on the battlefield was the use of British Mark I tanks at the Battle of Fleurs Corslet part of the Battle of the Somme on 15 September 1916, with mixed results, many broke down, but nearly a third succeeded in breaking through. Of the 49 tanks shipped to the Somme, only 32 were able to begin the first attack in which they were used and only nine made it across no man's land to the German lines. The tanks had been rushed into combat before the design was mature enough against Churchill's and Ernest Swinton's wishes and the number was small but their use gave important feedback on how to design newer tanks, the soundness of the concept, and their potential to affect the course of the war. On the other hand, the French army was critical of the British employment of small numbers of tanks at this battle. They felt the British had sacrificed the secrecy of the weapon while employing it in numbers too small to be decisive. 
Considering that the British attack was part of an Anglo-French offensive while the Russians were also attacking at the same time, Haig felt justified in making a maximum effort, regardless of the limitations of the tank force. The Mark is were capable of performing on the real battlefield of World War I, one of the most difficult battlefield terrains ever. They did have reliability problems, but when they were working they could cross trenches or craters of 9 feet meters and drive right through barbed wire. It was still common for them to get stuck, especially in larger bomb craters, but overall the rhomboid shape allowed for extreme terrain mobility. Tank crews who had read press reports depicting the new weapon driving through buildings and trees, and crossing wide rivers, were disappointed. Most World War I tanks could travel only at about a walking pace at best. Their steel armor could stop small arms fire and fragments from high explosive artillery shells. However they were vulnerable to a direct hit from artillery and mortar shells. The environment inside was extremely unpleasant, as ventilation was inadequate the atmosphere was heavy with poisonous carbon monoxide from the engine and firing the weapons, fuel and oil vapors from the engine and cordite fumes from the weapons. Temperatures inside could reach 50 degrees Celsius 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Entire crews lost consciousness inside the tanks, or collapsed when again exposed to fresh air. Crews learned how to create and leave behind supply dumps of fuel, motor oil, and tread grease, and converted obsolete models into supply vehicles for newer ones. To counter the danger of bullet splash or fragments knocked off the inside of the hull, the crew wore helmets with goggles and chainmail masks. Fragments were not as dangerous as fire, because of explosive fumes and the large amount of fuel aboard, smoking was prohibited inside and within 20 yards outside tanks. Gas masks were also standard issue, as they were to all soldiers at this point in the war due to the use of chemical warfare. The side armor of 8mm initially made them largely immune to small arms fire, but could be penetrated by the recently developed armor piercing K bullets. There was also the danger of being overrun by infantry and attacked with grenades. The next generation had thicker armor, making them nearly immune to the K bullets. In response, the Germans developed a larger purpose-made anti-tank rifle, the 3.7 cm Tok 1918 anti-tank gun, and also a Gebalt Ladung bunched charge. Several regular stick grenades bundled together for a much bigger explosion. Engine power was a primary limitation on the tanks. The roughly 100 horsepower engines gave a power to weight ratio of 3.3 horsepower ton to 5 kilowatts, ton. By the end of the 20th century, power to weight ratios exceeded 20 horsepower, ton, 15 kilowatts, ton. Many feel that because the British commander Field Marshal Douglas Haig was himself a horse cavalryman, his command failed to appreciate the value of tanks. In fact, horse cavalry doctrine in World War I was to follow up a breakthrough with harassing attacks in the rear. But there were no breakthroughs on the Western Front until the tanks came along. Despite these supposed views of Haig, he made an order for 1,000 tanks shortly after the failure at the Somme and always remained firmly in favor of further production. In 1919, Major General Sir Lewis Jackson said, the tank was a freak. The circumstances which called it into existence were exceptional and not likely to recur. If they do, they can be dealt with by other means. Topic. French developments France at the same time developed its own tracked AFVs, but the situation there was very different. In Britain a single committee had coordinated design, and had to overcome the initial resistance of the army, while the major industries remained passive. Almost all production effort was thus concentrated into the Mark I and its direct successors, all very similar in shape. In France, on the other hand, there were multiple and conflicting lines of development which were badly integrated, resulting in three major and quite disparate production types. 
A major arms producer, Schneider, took the lead in January 1915 and tried to build a first armored vehicle based on the Baby Holt tractor but initially the development process was slow until in July they received political, even presidential, support by combining their project with that of a mechanical wire cutter devised by engineer and politician Jean-Louis Brayton. In December 1915, the influential Colonel Estienne made the Supreme Command very enthusiastic about the idea of creating an armored force based on these vehicles. Strong army support for tanks was a constant during the decades that followed. Already in January and February 1916 quite substantial orders were made, at that moment with a total number of 800 much larger than the British ones. Army enthusiasm and haste had its immediate drawbacks however. As a result of the involvement of inexperienced army officers ordered to devise a new tank based on the larger 75-horsepower Holt chassis in a very short period of time, the first French tanks were poorly designed with respect to the need to cross trenches and did not take the sponson mounting route of the British tanks. The first, the Char Schneider CA equipped with a short 75mm howitzer, had poor mobility due to a short track length combined with a hull that overhung front and rear. It was unreliable as well, a maximum of only about 130 of the 400 built were ever operational at the same time. Then industrial rivalry began to play a detrimental role, it created the heavy Char Street Chamond, a parallel development not ordered by the army but approved by government through industrial lobby, which mounted much more impressive weaponry. Its 75mm was the most powerful gun fielded by any operational tank up till 1941. But also combined many of the Schneider CA's faults with an even larger overhanging body. Its innovative petro-electrical transmission, while allowing for easy steering, was insufficiently developed and led to a large number of breakdowns. But industrial initiative also led to swift advances. The car industry, already used to vehicle mass production and having much more experience in vehicle layout, in 1916 designed the first practical light tanks, a class largely neglected by the British. It was Renault's excellent small tank design, the FT, incorporating a proper climbing face for the tracks, that was the first tank to incorporate a top-mounted turret with a full 360 degrees traverse capability. In fact the FT was in many respects the first truly modern tank having a layout that has been followed by almost all designs ever since, driver at the front, main armament in a fully rotating turret on top, engine at the rear. Previous models had been box tanks, with a single crowded space combining the role of engine room, fighting compartment, ammunition stock and driver's cabin. A very similar Peugeot prototype, with a fixed casemate mounting a short 75mm cannon, was trialed in 1918 but the idea was not pursued. The FT had the largest production run of any tank of the war, with over 3,700 built, more numerous than all British tanks combined. That this would happen was at first far from certain, some in the French army lobbied for the alternative mass production of super-heavy tanks. Much design effort was put in this line of development resulting in the gigantic Char 2C, the most complex and technologically advanced tank of its day. Its very complexity ensured it being produced too late to participate in World War I and in the very small number of just ten, but it was the first tank with a three-man turret, the heaviest to enter service until late in World War II and still the largest ever operational. French production at first lagged behind the British. After August 1916 however, British tank manufacture was temporarily halted to wait for better designs, allowing the French to overtake their allies in numbers. When the French used tanks for the first time on 16 April 1917, during the Nivelle Offensive, they had four times more tanks available. But that did not last long as the offensive was a major failure, the Schneiders were badly deployed and suffered 50% losses from German long-range artillery. The St. Shaman tanks, first deployed on 5 May, proved to be so badly designed that they were unable to cross the first line of German trenches. <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> German developments. Germany concentrated more on the development of anti-tank weapons than on development of tanks themselves. They only developed one type of tank which saw combat in the war. The A7V Sturmpanzerwagen was designed in 1917 and was used in battle from March 1918. It was manned by a crew of 18, and had eight machine guns and a 57mm cannon. Only 20 A7 verses were produced during the war. Topic: Battle of Cambrai. The first battle in which tanks made a great impact was the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. British Colonel J.F.C. Fuller, Chief of Staff of the Tank Corps, was responsible for the tank's role in the battle. They made an unprecedented breakthrough but, as ever on the Western Front, the opportunity was not exploited. Ironically, it was the soon-to-be-supplanted horse cavalry that had been assigned the task of following up the motorized tank attack. Tanks became more effective as the lesson of the early tanks was absorbed. The British produced the Mark IV in 1917. Similar to the early marks in appearance, its construction was considered to produce a more reliable machine. The long-barreled naval guns were shortened. The barrels of the earlier, longer guns were prone to digging in the mud when negotiating obstacles, and armor was increased just enough to defeat the standard German armor-piercing bullet. The continued need for four men to drive the tank was solved with the Mark V, which used Wilson's epicyclic gearing in 1918. Also in 1918 the French produced the Renault FT, the result of a cooperation between Estien and Louis Renault. As mentioned before, it had the innovative turret position, and was operated by two men. At just 8 tons it was half the weight of the medium A whippet but the version with the cannon had more firepower. It was conceived for mass production, and the FT became the most produced tank of World War I by a wide margin, with over 3,000 delivered to the French army. Large numbers were used by the Americans and several were also lent to the British. In July 1918, the French used 480 tanks mostly FTs at the Battle of Soissons, and there were even larger assaults planned for the next year. In Plan 1919, the Entente hoped to commit over 30,000 tanks to battle in that year. Topic. Whippet Finally, in a preview of later developments, the British developed the Whippet. This tank was specifically designed to exploit breaches in the enemy front with its relatively higher speed, around 8 miles per hour versus 3 to 4 miles per hour for the British heavy tanks. The Whippet was faster than most other tanks, although it carried only machine gun armament, meaning it was not suited to combat with armored vehicles but instead with infantry. Post-war tank designs reflected this trend towards greater tactical mobility. Topic. Villers Bretonneux, tank against tank The German general staff did not have enthusiasm for the tanks, but allowed the development of anti tank weapons. Regardless, development of a German tank was underway. The only project to be produced and fielded was the A 7V, although only 20 were built. The majority of the 50 or so tanks fielded by Germany were captured British vehicles. A7 verses were captured by the Allies, but they were not used, and most ended up being scrapped. The first tank versus tank battles took place 24 April 1918. It was an unexpected engagement between three German A7 verses and three British MK. IVs at Villers Bretonneux. Fuller's plan 1919, involving massive use of tanks for an offensive, was never used because the blockade of Germany and the entry of the U.S. brought an end to the war. Topic. See also History of tanks 
Comparison of World War I tanks Tanks of the interwar period Tanks in World War II Comparison of early World War II tanks Topic. Notes and references Glanfield, John, 2001, Devil's Chariots, The Birth and Secret Battles of the First Tanks. Stroud, Sutton Tucker, Spencer C. World War I, The Definitive Encyclopedia and Document Collection. Volume 4. R.Z., 1536. Santa Barbara, C.A., A.B.C. Clio, L.L.C., 2014. Topic. Further reading Charles River Editors and Colin Fluxman. The Tanks of World War I, The History and Legacy of Tank Warfare During the Great War 2017. Foley, Michael. Rise of the Tank, Armored Vehicles and Their Use in the First World War 2014. Townsend, Reginald T. December 1916. Quote, quote, tanks. And. The Hose of Death. Quote, quote, the World's Work, A History of Our Time, 195-207. Retrieved 4 August 2009. Kaplan, Lawrence M. Ed., Pershing's Tankers, Personal Accounts of the AEF Tank Corps in World War I, University Press of Kentucky, 314 pages, Primary Sources, Memoirs. Smithers, A. J. Combray, The First Great Tank Battle, 2014. Zaloga, Stephen J. and Tony Bryan. French Tanks of World War I, 2010. Topic. External links Lancelot de Mole's Tank Models WW1 Tanks 1914-1918 Kennedy, Michael David, Tanks and Tank Warfare 1914-1918 Online. International Encyclopedia of the First World War